address. And so we can like apply the same definition again. So we define an epsilon anti-degradable term in the sense that this anti-degradability condition holds with respect to the diamond norm up to an epsilon. And then we prove that um, the quantum capacity for this, for an anti-degradable channel is just bounded by this term here, which only depends on epsilon. And this bound turns out to be good in the, in the low noise regime. So you see that this is only good if it's close to zero. OK. Um, there's something else I, I just want to briefly mention. So there's this, this concept of the symmetric side channel assisted capacity introduced by Smith, Smolin, and Winter. And what is nice about this quantity is that it is seeing a letter form. It's always an upper bound to the capacity. And importantly, it's, um, the, the function that maps the channel to this QSS quantity is convex. So this means we can now um, use, OK, prove this upper bound here for the QSS capacity in terms of our U function that is, that is easy to compute. It's this convex optimization problem. And since this is convex, it allows us to combine like different, different bounds. So if you, if you have at the low noise level a bound that is better, and at the high noise level another one that is better, and in the middle maybe again another one that is better, we can somehow use the convexity here to combine these, these different bounds. OK. So OK, if there's time, let me spend like a few minutes on, on other capacities. So far, um, I only spoke about the quantum capacity of a quantum channel that indicates how much quantum information can you reliably transmit over a channel. So another capacity that suffers more or less the same, the same drawbacks as the quantum capacity is like the private classical capacities. So this capacity tells us how much classical information can we reliably transmit over a quantum channel asymptotically in the sense that it's also secure, in, okay, that it's also secure in the sense that Eve cannot get any information about the information, uh, any information about the message that was sent. So this is um, defined as this quantity here. Again, we have like um, a limit here, so a, a regularization. And this P1, this private information, this is called, it's given by a single letter optimization problem that it's also not so easy to compute directly. And we have, okay, almost anything, or almost everything is similar as with the quantum capacity. So we know that the P1 is always a, lo a lower bound to the P. We know that um, this lower bound can be strictly, strictly worse. In other words, we know that this limit here is necessary. And we know for degradable channels, um, all these quantities, they coincide. So the private information is, is the same as the private capacity, which is the same as the coherent information, which is the same as the quantum capacity. And so therefore, um, somehow one would hope that um, we could, like, at least in an approximate sense, also recycle this result here for approximate degradable channels. And this turns out to be possible indeed. So we can prove like, that the private capacity is upper bounded by the private information plus some error term. Or if you want to relate it to the coherent information, you can prove that the, then again the private information is upper bounded by the coherent information plus some error term. And we know from before that this coherent information is, is related to this U function that is easy to compute. So we can now have all kind of bounds, and we can plug them together to, to get bounds that are um, efficiently computed. OK, um, okay so, so what, what we saw in this talk is that somehow this concept that was introduced by Shaw and Devetak of a, of a degradable channel, this can be made robust in a sense that um, we at least approximately preserve all the quantities that degradable channels have. I mean, they have some other quantities too that I didn't discuss now in this talk, but I say oh, all, the, all the properties that I saw that are important for degradable channels, we can prove that they are approximately preserved for this um, epsilon degradable channels. And so this is then useful, for example, to compute the upper bounds. So we have upper bounds that we can compute efficiently by just solving the SDP and um, solving this coherent information problem. Um, what would be maybe interesting for future work is to see whether um, something similar could also work for um, the case where we have like infinite dimensional channels, like for example, a Gaussian bosonic channels. So there, um, the situation is similar. So for degradable channels, there are few results known. But if the channel is not degradable, then we know it's essentially nothing. And it's not totally obvious that something like that would work because, um, OK, if you remember the proof sketch, so we used, for example, this Alitsky-Farnes inequality, so these continuity statements. 
and they usually have like dimension bounds. Also in, in the upper bounds, if you remember them, we usually have like, like dimension factors that are there. So if, if you consider like infinite dimensional chance, then this seems to be a problem. But um, in this improvement of dalitsky fanes inequality, Andreas Winter also proved like continuity statements for, for the entropy or for the conditional entropy for um, infinite dimensional states if they have in addition an energy constraint. So one could hope that something similar works for like Gaussian bosonic channels that have an energy constraint. Or one could also hope like if there are classical information theorists around, um, there's a, a, a famous problem there uh, which is like characterizing the capacity of a broadcast channel. And this is in some sense related to the quantum capacity. So we have a classical channel that broadcasts with one input and two outputs, let's say. And there, um, um, the community is also a little bit stuck, so we, we don't know a single letter <laughs> formula for the capacity, except in the case where the channel is degradable. There, everything is easy and nice, so one could hope that one gets maybe also bounds that are interesting um, in the classical scenario. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thanks. When you plotted the best known bounds for the uh, depolarizing channel, are you aware of the paper with uh, Graham and me called Additive Extensions of a Quantum Channel? Because it actually has a better <coughs> bound than any of the ones you mentioned. No, I think this is actually your bound, the blue one. Okay, that's the, the bound. Yes, that this is your bound, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, just, well, you mentioned several techniques for bounding uh, things, and you didn't mention that one, so I wanted to make sure. Ah, yes, if, sorry. If you sorry weren't aware that. of that paper, no one is, because. <laughs> No, Nobody I'm aware of that it. paper. Yes, no, no, yes. I'm aware. Okay, I did, sorry, I didn't explain it, but okay, the plot, is, uh, this yeah. bound is yours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, but <laughs> then he listed them all explicitly, wasn't it? Okay, thanks. <laughs> Other questions? I have a question. So have you done something similar for, have you thought of doing something similar for like classical capacities? For example, I don't know, epsilon um, EB channels? Um, no, no, okay, no, I didn't, didn't think about that. Okay, for, for sure, like degrade, oh, okay. As far as I know, like the concept of degradable channels is not so useful um, for the classical capacity, right? But yeah. okay, y you're speaking about some, some, some other, like for example, um, entanglement we're breaking or some other yes, channel for it which It looks we like whenever you have like, that things are continuous, which most capacities are, as it has been proven, then it looks like something like that could be helpful. It's just important that you define it with respect to the diamond <coughs> norm, that things are stable. But yes, probably it should work. So I just wanted to ask, how does this concept of uh, being close to a degradable channel behaves under tensor product? For example, does your technique show if a channel is epsilon one close to a degradable channel, and the second one is epsilon two, close to a degradable channel, their tensor product is, do you know? Yes, yes this is a question I was asked uh, already before, um, one, one or two times. Um, I don't fully understand it. So, so, so it, it is indeed likely that if you would like consider like multiple, li li let's say two copies of the channel, that then this epsilon would decrease. So, so we spend a few time to see whether we can prove something like that. So, so for example, that um, the epsilon gets better and better if you consider like more copies of the channel. Um, seems plausible, and but but we couldn't see a way to prove this. We For example, okay. is it known that the product of two uh, non-degradable uh, channels would it be possible that you take the product of two uh, channels that are each of them individually are not degradable, and the result would become degradable? Um, okay. As far Pro as you know. Okay, probably there are some people in the audience that know this the answer precisely. As far as I know, okay, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, the next talk starts at 11.40, so if you want to switch sessions, you have five minutes to do that.
It's on mute right now, so you need to switch it on. Okay. Okay, let's uh, start. Uh, the uh, next talk, uh, I guess it's the last talk for the morning, is